Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our session. Um, I am Shannon DeFranza, our National Vice President for the American Institute of Architecture students, and we are so excited to be bringing you this session. Uh, just put a window there um, on being intentional with glass in the face of climate catastrophe and really just being intentional in design with the windows you use. So um, it happens to all design students myself included, you have a wall, you have a deadline tomorrow, you have no patience left, what do you do with that wall? You put a window there because it looks nice. Um, but sometimes that's really not the best solution or you're going about it the wrong way because let's face it, you really don't learn about windows and components as much as you should in design school. Um, sometimes the windows should be in a different direction. Sometimes there's a specific type of glass you should use. Sometimes the framing should be chosen about precipitation and it goes on and on and on. So how do we really use glass to make our enclosures better in the age of climate change and just to make our designs better. So we're gonna be joined by a panel of experts who I'll introduce right now. Um, so first we have Elaine Adams. Um, she is a Tennessee raised bioclimatic architect. She's a mom, a foodie, an urban designer, an electric car and clean energy advocate. And she serves as the sustainability leader for LS3P Associates. Um, she's a 306, which is a 360 person architecture firm located in the Carolinas and Georgia. Um, she is also a Rocky Mountain Institute alum and is a member of the AIA COTE advisory group and large firm sustainability roundtable. And she is a national voice for bioclimatic high performance architecture, sustainable urban design and environmental accountability. So thank you for joining us, Elaine. Um, now we have Patrick Charles, who is a former professor of mine, and Patrick Charles holds a diploma from the Ecole d'Architecture in Nancy, France, um, and a Master of Science in Architectural Studies from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He started his professional career at the Renzo Piano Building Workshop in Paris, France, and since 2000 he has taught at IIT, Roger Williams, and Cornell. He has taught design studios and various other courses in the areas of construction, building envelopes, sustainability, structure, building systems, and building performance simulation. His current research interest is actually in building envelopes and systems, natural ventilation, and the so-called concept-based sustainable solutions. And finally, we are uh, joined by Michael Marmo. Uh, Michael is an architectural consultant for Sierra Pacific Windows, and Sierra Pacific is the country's largest privately owned forest land. Uh, the Sierra Pacific is the largest privately owned forest land with over 2.3 million acres. He is nearly a 30-year veteran in the wood-clad window category with a wide range of experiences in every audience. Uh, his pursuit of the building sciences be began during the summers while attending college at Westfield State University, framing new homes on weekends for book money. Uh, as an architectural consultant, he enjoys assisting the design community create their project visions through window solutions, and he has worked on projects as small as single openings to historic projects enveloping city blocks and embraces every challenge. Um, he's also been married to his wife, Michelle, for 22 years, and they have three children. And when Michael isn't working, you'll probably find him on a baseball field, on a golf course, looking at comedy, listening to comedy tracks, or tinkering with technology. So thank you all. We have a wide uh, array of people on this panel, and we're super excited to have them all. Um, but I am going to turn it over to them now, um, and they're each going to kind of introduce themselves and their area of expertise. So um, we're going to start with Elaine. Elaine, take it away. Thank you. Sharing my screen now. And hopefully you can see it. I am Elaine Gallagher Adams. I am the sustainability leader for a large architecture firm in the Southeast. Uh, we do a, a wide variety of commercial projects. This is me when I was little. I have always been a tree hugger. I grew up in what's essentially a North Georgia rainforest that's no longer a rainforest. Um, the changes in the environment have, have really struck me my whole life. I started to see it when I was a teenager and it continues to change. And I continue to try to do my best to, to, um, to help mitigate it. 
Well, my first project as a project architect was the um, renovation and addition to a historic hotel in Denver, the Hotel Teatro. It's still a beautiful hotel. I'm very proud of the project. We retrofitted all those windows. Um, it was an interesting job done with historic preservation tax credits. It really got me looking at energy and windows and, and how, that, how it actually works with historic buildings specifically. Um, one of my last projects uh, at, on, the, on the design team of a project specifically was the National Museum of African American History and Culture. I was responsible for sustainable design measures and strategies and goals for the whole project. We nailed it. Uh, it achieved me lead gold and is the best performing building in the Smithsonian portfolio. This building is 110 percent glazed with a uh, with a, a punctured corona we call it around the building that was tuned specifically by my team to um, to uh, reject just enough heat gain to keep the building pretty much in balance and uh, and reduce a lot of energy use. The last image on the right is the sustainability action plan for LS3P associates. We are absolutely committed to reducing carbon emissions in buildings to um, operations in buildings to tw in by 2030 and um, uh, carbon total carbon in buildings by 2050. So we're on board with all of the commitments and we are indeed committed. This is not going. Where's my next slide? There it is. Um, when we look at windows, uh, don't know how many of you are introduced to the energy standards that ASHRAE offers. Uh, these are really the backbone of most of the energy codes that we have in the United States. This is ASHRAE 90.1. If you take the lead exam, uh, this is your default answer for a lot of the trick questions. What is it? ASHRAE 90.1. This happens to be an excerpt from the latest version of it, which is a 2019 standard. Um, and it is soon to be adopted, I believe. Uh, nobody, no, none of the states have adopted it yet, but it is so right now the most stringent uh, energy standard uh, that's been uh, put together. ASHRAE, the, the 90.1 is actually on track to um, meet the architecture 2030 net zero energy goals by um, at the same time. So by the time we get to 2030, ASHRAE 90.1 should be setting us up for net zero buildings. But if you want to know the qualities of the building of the windows that you that you need to start working with and really understand it, if you're going for the um, the code competition, the code top 10 student competition, which I do run, um, you need to be able to be specific about what type of windows you're you're um, you're thinking about for your project. Sometimes you don't want a lot of uh, heat rejection. Depends on where the project is, right? But you need to understand what those goals would be. I'm not gonna go through all this, but this is where you look by climate zone for the performance of your windows. We wanna look at window wall ratio. We think about this a lot. It is, um, it is a factor in energy modeling. Those of you who are playing with Insight, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, when the sweet spot for window wall ratio is 40%, and that is often the recommendation uh, in ASHRAE 90.1 really for energy, it would rather you not have any windows. So that's a given, but we want windows. So 40% is sort of that sweet spot between creating daylit human spa human, uh, is humanistic spaces and, um, and energy efficiency. Sometimes when I tell a designer, you know, let's reduce this down to 40%, they think, oh, that's such a small window. It's really not. Look how big the window is, the 40% mark, right? We don't need 100% glazing. I was talking to the uh, sustainability director for SOM and she says, oh my God, I look at these projects and they're hundred percent glazed and they're telling me it's a green building and I'm telling them it's not, can't be, right? So it's really important to understand that. We also look at the combination of, uh, of really attributes of the wall and the wall insulate, insulative value versus the, the windows themselves. And um, when you look at 50% wall, 50% window, you're really struggling to get a good wall performance, right? A good envelope performance. But as you start to experiment with different percentages, you can actually, in this 
example here, we can increase energy efficiency by 150% by understanding that if we can increase the U value of a window or at least control the U value of a window um, and work together with the R value of the, of the, wind, of the wall itself, it's, it's not always obvious what the best combination is. And I'm not wording that very well, but if you look at this, this example, you can start to follow it all the way through. Then we look at the actual glazing properties. Oh my gosh, there's so much, so many kinds of glass right now. I have right now on my desk, avian glass, which is, um, it has a slight pattern to it so that birds don't hit it. Uh, buildings kill more birds than anything other than house cats, by the way, your cat's killing more birds than buildings, but still the buildings are a huge quantity of birds. I believe that green buildings shouldn't kill animals. So I'm super focused on um, designing buildings that, that the birds uh, don't fly into. But we've got the avian glass, we've got electrochromic glass, which we're starting to use in even lower budget projects. It used to be cost prohibitive, and now it's kind of a no brainer. There's even retrofit products that we can use to, to, use to create electrochromic glass. You can either tint it a different color or you can vary the transparency of the glass. It's really interesting. The, the off position is the color or, the, or the, um, the frosted condition of it. And when you charge it up, it goes clear. It's really interesting. You can also attach that to, uh, it can be thermochromic. So when the heat hits the glass, it can turn a color. So it just depends on what your trigger is gonna be. We've talked a lot at LS3P lately about fritted glass. So I had a, a designer come to me and say, well, should I just, I, this building's taking on too much heat, should we just tint the windows? And I said, you have to understand that tinting the windows really addresses glare, not heat gain. A little bit of heat gain, but not really. If you wanna keep the heat out, you have to put something on the outside of the glass, right? Keep the heat from even entering the building. Those blinds that people put inside a building don't keep the heat out. It just kind of bounces it between the blinds and the glass, right? You wanna keep it on the outside of the glass. So fritted glass, I'm a huge fan. Um, if you can't, if you're in a position where you can't have overhangs or whatever, or you just want that clean look, fritted glass can reject a lot of the heat that hits it. You're still dealing with glass. You're not getting the insulated values of, a, of an insulated constructed wall but it's probably the best glass you're gonna be able to get as far as rejection. And then understand your window label. And probably Mike is gonna go into this a little bit, but glass has come so far. In 2003, um, spectrally selective glazing was introduced to the market. It was super expensive. None of us could do it. By about 2009, it was appearing in standard catalogs, Marvin, um, I'm sure Sierra Pacific, they, they were starting to, to um, include spectrally selective glass, but they weren't calling it that. Uh, a lot of manufacturers continue to call it low E because technically it is low emissivity glass. However, it has much more complex uh, attributes to it. It came out of nanotechnology and you should be looking at super high performance glass and you can get it really clear. It's changing how we look at buildings. I am a huge fan of Revit and Insight. And I know that a lot of professors don't want you using Revit early on. For me, when I taught, you know, you guys need to get internships. You need to know Revit. If you're gonna know Revit, you need to learn Insight because Insight allows you to do an energy analysis and really look at your glazing properties and your glazing percentage. And I'm running really long here, I think, but we have a, um, this is an example of how I took a project that was in development. It's a terrible orientation. It's really tough. That corner of the building faces due south. So it's getting not only southeast, but southwest sun. And the design team really wanted a lot of glass. And I ran it through this, uh, looking at vertical shades, horizontal shades, combination. And it was interesting how it felt, how energy use dropped a little bit. And then when I started looking at glazing iterations, really reducing the amount of glazing, going from 95% glazing to 80% glazing was a huge drop in energy. And then when we went down to that sweet spot of 40, I was able to reduce the energy use by half from my base design. Huge, fantastic tool. This took me an hour and 20 minutes to do. 
you should be doing that on all of your projects in school so that you can justify it and you get some great images. You can really use that in your storytelling. And that's it. Amazing. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, and now I'm going to pass it to Patrick. Okay, let me share my screen. Okay, thanks, Ellen. You've touched on so many uh, very interesting issues. Um, uh, on my side, I'm going to sh show you a little project that I liked and I've written about. And if you want to uh, uh, know a little bit more, go to that uh, steel structure that breathes. Uh, it's a gym building that's, that's part of a school compound in uh, Thun, Switzerland, built by Müller Verden Architecten. And uh, as you can see, it's a big box. There's some courts uh, you can play. There's some also uh, natural ventilation. I, I like glass, but I know you need to have ventilation that goes with it. I don't want to do too much glass. I like a lot of glass, but I need to be smart about possibly even uh, concealing the natural ventilation so that it's not destroying the image of the glass, uh, but allowing us to have it. So we see that there's three pairs of natural ventilation exhaust points at the roof can also be uh, used for um, smoke exhaust. And the innovation in this particular design is the introduction of those little vents that are all around the perimeter. They are nicely concealed at the interface between the upper portion that I call the lantern uh, made of polycarbonate and this lower band of glass. So the idea of introducing here is making we spend our life telling students say don't put the glass aligned with the columns. You're creating lots of uh, cold bridges conditions are going to be impossible to resolve. Bring your structure inside. It's warm and everything's going to be much simpler. And in this case, I go a little bit. I return, I flip the thing upon his head by looking at solution where the, the natural ventilation is integrated in the, in the structure. So in this case, that particular solution checks a number of interesting features when you do natural ventilation associated with big large glass facade. That, okay, it keeps the big glass quiet, very heavy, it's fixed, but we still have natural ventilation. It's not all, even if it's a, a, a hybrid ventilation, there's a mechanical ventilation as well as a natural ventilation capability to this building. It checks a number of good, interesting things to think about, to integrate when you think about uh, glass facades. The fact that it needs to be intr intrusion proof in terms of your ventilation, it's not to let animals or people in. It needs to be operable while it's raining. And that's the case here because it's in this little nook that's protected. And it's also here quasi also noise proof, which is kind of, if you sleep outside in the city, you'd like to be a ventilation and no, um, not too much noise coming in. So here it's integrated not to the primary structure, but to a secondary structure, to the girt. That is this uh, white flange that's spanning between columns, more, not quite at mid height, uh, seven feet above the ground. And uh, it's uh, as the little images on the on the right shows that the insulated uh, panel that can be operated uh, electrically actuated. Uh, the it's not a, a castellated beam, but it's a beam that had little cutouts made along the web, which are zero consequences structurally. And as we see uh, on on where my mouse is pointing, the PVC four inch PVC pipe that have been cut. And around that, they, they formed it. And uh, so you have this structural element, secondary structure, I concede, structural element nonetheless, that is uh, used and integrates uh, that, that ventilation. It's an interesting thing to discuss because normally we say, okay, structure is not precise, and uh, you want to have some kind of correction, XYZ correction to let you go from the imprecise structure to the final precise layer of envelope of the building. And in this case, since it's completely applied onto the white flange itself, there's not that uh, typical paradigm of let's separate the enclosure from the, from the structure. So I found that interesting. I am going to... Elaine did, uh, uh, made a lot of good points about already the specific or an architect's day-to-day -day thinks about it. I'm going to give you a few scientific refreshers. When you talk about glass, unlike opaque material, you, you have also transmission to account for. It's not just solar radiation that is being absorbed by the material. 
or reflected by the surface. It's also in the case of transparent and translucent, you have that transmission, which then ties to everything that Elaine said about, you know, super glass with lots of progress and, and, and being done uh, into that. But you, really, we as students, faculty, people living, we use to our thermostat that make us think about air temperature and we not, don't think enough about the radiative environment around us, which nonetheless has a huge impact. If I do light activity, like now, office work, I lose 45% of my body heat is lost via a radiative means. Me exchanging with the windows next to me, or the surface that more or less, even in the winter, around 70 Fahrenheit, around my, my skin being at 94 Fahrenheit, I'll, I'm, um, there's definitely a lot of radiative exchange. So it's important also that ties to this, this issue of uh, having the shading on the right side of the glass, I, on the outside, as opposed to the inside where the heat is already in, and now you have, you're dealing with a very hot temperature of surface that needs to be offset by cooler air. So in terms of sustainability, you, immediately you go in the wrong path. Um, by uh, having to go to chilling as opposed to perhaps other radiative means of activating the structure to um, uh, condition the buildings. So, besides that transmission reflection on um, absorption, which is then dissipated, I re-radiated or this convectively or by conduction near the edge of the glass, uh, another important aspect we everybody needs to understand clearly about glass is that glass is transparent to the uh, ultraviolet to the visible which make it transparent to our vision and to the shorter wavelengths of the infrared however glass is not transparent is opaque is absorbent absorbs the longer wavelengths of the infrared which are the wavelengths that I emit, my body is emitting at, or the patch of heat that has been let into the room through the, the window, uh, through the glass that hit the ground now is re-emitting in the, you know, medium-ish temperature. And this is that longer wave length of glass and of, of radiation and glass is opaque to that, glass absorbs it. So it creates this imbalance, which in a sense creates this, uh, um, the green ass effect. So this was just, a, I'm not going to comment on that, but it's just to put in your eyes again the profile of the solar spectrum, which is ultraviolet visible and a short wavelengths of infrared, as opposed to here on two different scales. So don't be fooled. This black body spectra at 70, 20 Celsius and minus 30 Celsius, it's a very a tiny, tiny, tiny bump in the, in, compared to the magnitude of the of the solar spectrum, but that's what we're talking about. The point is, they're not centered on the same uh, wavelengths, which is make uh, why having spectrally selective products is is really important because you're trying to to uh, be to keep heat out, to keep radiation out at a certain wavelength and and in at another wavelength. That's really the key to to solve many of our issues. Another important issue is that this amount of transmission, which is called transmittance as a, as a ratio between how much is transmitted versus the total incoming uh, radiation, that this amount of transmission is completely dependent on the angle of incidence. So if the sun shines perpendicular to the, to the glass, any to graph or just a single pane of glass, so not very efficient in terms of U value, but let's more, has less reflection, uh, so it's actually more positive in terms of the, the transmittance through it, but still not going to be, it's only going to be around 0.9, 90%. There's still some reflection and some absorption going on. When we can see from the graph with the, where the red arrow is pointing, after 45 degree angle, when the sun angle is now passed at, at 45 degree or beyond of angle of incidence, the reflection kicks in tremendously and there's very little transmittance. That's why is that important is that it explained why certain facades orientation in heating hungry climate of the Northeast, where I teach, unlike perhaps where Elaine is working, where they might have to say, okay, we have, we have plenty of heat most of the time. 
uh, a south facade is great because it has the sun is low during the winter January February March and also the, the months toward the end of the year so there's a high level of solar radiation that can penetrate into through a south facing window at this mid latitude uh, and this is an idealized uh, uh, graph but the also the with the high, the angle of incidence being that the sun is high in the sky during the summer makes that there's little uh, um, the, 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 there's not much solar radiation that comes on top of already the nice temp air temperature that we enjoy during the, during the summer so it makes the south facade very favorable in contrast, east and west, not that great. It doesn't give you any benefit in the winter and it actually hammers you a little bit during the summer, adds more solar radiation when you don't need it because the temperature is already very comfortable and it's even worse with an horizontal facing skylight, for example. So if you do an horizontal skylight, you put some quotes and you actually maybe make it as so too, making sure that uh, you're actually looking toward the north and making the, the part that is facing south or west uh, much more opaque, at least heavily uh, fritted. All right, finally, uh, I think we, through software, you can do some good stuff. Here it's a mapping of the, the amount of solar radiation that is received cumulatively uh, throughout the year. Here it's a little study for uh, buildings or a little, a little square in, um, in San Francisco, I believe. But below it's the application of that. Say, once you know that there's this amount of solar radiation received by this little portion of the facade, which actually happens to be shaded sometime by the neighboring building, you can start to tailor which glass should be used at what part of the building. And this is done, it's in, actually in the 90s, so it's not completely new technology. Uh, by uh, here, a little fuzzy image, I apologize for the quality, uh, by uh, Richard Rogers for a bur uh, building in, um, in Berlin. So tailored facade, knowing what are the neighboring condition, the shading condition, the changing, what is the needs for the, this particular facade, tailoring the choice of glazing to a particular condition. That's it for me. Wonderful. And I think a really good overview into the systems thinking that goes into the use of glass because there's ventilation, there's the science behind it. You should really know all of this before you make your decisions. It's like reading a contract. Um, all right, Michael, let's uh, pass it over to you. So uh, uh, thank you both Elaine and Patrick. Uh, um, your wealth of knowledge is amazing. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit about um, what I do uh, or for who I do it with. And uh, Elaine, one of your comments early on was that you're a tree hugger. We are, we champion tree huggers uh, for the company I work for. We are uh, Sierra Pacific Industries. We're Sierra, Sierra Pacific Windows is a um, company within the umbrella of Sierra Pacific Industries. And they are the, as mentioned before, we are the um, country's largest privately owned forest land owner in, in the country of um, over 2.3 million acres. And oftentimes uh, su sustainability is a term that's um, loosely used by anybody who can grab onto it and put the name on the side of a paper cup or, or whatever and, and use that phrase. And it, it, um, it really shouldn't be thrown around as loosely as it is, but um, sustainability really re represents a company's ability to, to make a profit uh, without sacrificing the resources of its people and community and the planet. So really, it's um, um, it's 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 our business. It's the way that we do our um, the way we go to to market. Um, so Sierra Pacific is a as I mentioned is is a um, now the largest forest land owner. Uh, here you see an image of one of our uh, pieces of property. It's um, you, you know there's sometimes when we see in the in the news when there's forest fires. And people think it's just a flat plain of land where there's some trees growing on it. Putting fires out is, is easy, but you can see the terrain is, is not um, flat or typical. But we are committed to, so the way that we do our business is we are committed to managing our lands in a responsible and sustainable manner where we truly protect our, the environment around us, the environment that we work within. 
And our goals is to continually invest in our in our properties and continue to grow new forests. We um, each year we plant about an eight million trees. Um, plus or minus depends on if there were wildfires or what have um, or demands that um, would make for the need for us to plant more. We plant um, a handful of uh, varieties of trees, uh, Douglas fir, white fir, hemlock, ponderosa pine, sugar pine. So I mentioned all this in, in general. Uh, I'm talking a lot about wood. We are, uh, Sierra Pacific is a wood company, so we make um, uh, wood timber curtain walls and naturally wood windows. Uh, all of these things have glass within them. We don't create the glass. We get the glass comes from a different source. But uh, we certainly do uh, work with a lot of glass. But I mentioned that conversationally, uh, who we are and what we do for um, the environment. Um, what we also do, so being sustainably um, responsible with all the trees that we we harvest, there are some some uh, waste that's produced from our the sawdust that's created, and all of our we have now we have um, eight biomass cogeneration plants where the waste the the barks and the sawdust and things is re reused in these energy um, biomass cogeneration plants to create energy. So we, as a company, um, with our, ex our our surplus of energy that we create, we actually energize 139,000 homes annually from our our byproducts. So it's pretty um, it's pretty amazing how we're able to take uh, forestry where we're just cutting down trees or, or harvesting trees. I should say, um, and actually create energy and, and put back into the um, put back into the environment. You can see the body of water in front of that cogeneration plant. A lot of the, as we go through the steam process, a lot of that water is collected from um, when we heat that the the uh, the sawdust product. There's a lot of moisture in there. We're, we're able to recapture that and reuse it in our system. That's Northern California, where water is not a uh, uh, in a plentitude in any means. And where we can't put our cogeneration plants, we put solar panels. A lot of them. We did a, a solar array in 2019 to energize one of our plants. We also did another one in 2000. I mean, uh, and uh, we're doing one right now um, to energize another one of our plants. So um, we continue to um, reinvest in being a uh, sustainable, sustainably smart company. Um, so vertically integrated, so we, we talk about in our company, we talk a little bit about um, how we're able to take the forests of tomorrow that we're growing today. We're growing the forests that may not be harvested for some 30 years, some 100 years. Um, we have a unique seed to window manufacturing approach. We take the, uh, the, the kind of the farm to table, I guess, if you will, initiative. We, we take the, the plant from the seedling all the way to the finished product. And it could be anything from telephone poles to fencing to pencils to um, um, a broad range of things that we produce, but windows is most cer certainly our largest of the, the bunch. Um, you can see here, we, we, we own the land, we plant the trees and watching these individuals plant the trees, they'll do um, by hand because they have to go up mountain sides, but they'll, we don't have vehicles that plant these trees, but they'll climb the sides of a mountain, they'll plant 1500 of those little seedlings in a day and watch them go, it's interesting. But we manage the land, we process the wood, um, um, but we all of the wood that we buy is from ourselves. We use everything, I guess, in, in some time terms, the uh, the butchers say they use everything from the, the studer to the tutor. And we, uh, I guess in some ways we do the same thing, but from our, from our, uh, our waste, we create en energy and we assemble components. So the one thing that we do not create is glass, but we, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we most certainly, um, we most certainly use quite a bit of it. So we have a, it's a three generation company started back in 1929, I believe it is. And um, we, uh, we have over 5,000 employees and we're growing. So we choose to be green. And as I mentioned, Elaine, we champion our tree huggers. We have a lot of, uh, a lot of huggers up there in Northern California where most of our, um, our forests are. And uh, that, is, uh, that is all I wanted to share. Fantastic. Um, and a really good po point that glass is not 
the thing. <laughs> I know when, when we all put digital models together, you might on Rhino or uh, be putting in just a pane of glass and it just touches the structure and it looks great for your renders, but there is that framing component. It goes into the structure. It go, There's so many components. So um, thank you all for those introductions and just all of those different components that have to do with our design of windows um, in our buildings. Um, but now we're going to move on to some Q&A. Uh, so these have been fielded from some students and I'm very excited to ask you them. So um, I just want to get into some of the basics that maybe haven't been touched on. I'm going to skip over some questions you guys preemptively answered some of them. Um, so there are single, double, and triple glazing systems and um, of windows. Uh, when should each be used? Should all of them be used? Are they used in different times? Uh, Elaine, could you speak to that? Yeah, sure. Um, you, well, there's a couple of different aspects. One is rule of thumb is for each pane of glass, it's a it's R1, right? So in theory, if you had clear glass and you had three a triple pane clear glass window, it would be an R3. If it's a high performance glass, it kicks it up to an R4. So you can get R4 uh, U value of 0.25 out of a triple glaze, hyper, fairly good quality glass window. We can get them up even more when we when we put additional pieces of film in between those. Those are crazy expensive. It's really important to know what the impact of those when, of that window performance really has on your building though, before you do that. On the other hand, um, you know, it, if you're designing a, um, maybe you're in a Northern climate and you really want heat gain. And there are places I have designed, I have worked in North Dakota and we've had walls where on the south side of the building, we wanted heat gain. So we created a, a wall where um, where the heat was entering the building from about sep from September through June, because that's what we wanted. And it was essentially passively heated. We get that up in the Rocky Mountains. I did a lot of projects up in that area. So sometimes you don't want a high performance window, right? It's like sometimes we don't want a light colored pavement because you're kind of counting on the dark pavement melting the snow. So um, so you have to use your head when you're picking these. Don't assume that you have to go to the most high performance glass, right? Um, the other thing is sometimes you want different glass and different sizes of the building. In theory, you should have three different performance. On the north side, it's all about thermal performance because the sun's not coming in. I should say, not north. If this is a global audience away from the equator, you don't, you, you, it's all about thermal performance. Towards the equator, it's up to you how you want it to perform because we can shade it. I have total control over how much sun hits the south side of my, the equator side of my building. To the east and west, it's toast, literally toast. You're cooking on each side and you want to minimize that glass or get the highest performance you can get out of it. So the more panes of glass, the more it's thermally protective, but not necessarily keeping the heat out. Yeah, I'll add a little something if, you, if I may. Uh, what's interesting, I think you could use single glazing in the context of a buffer zone where it's maybe it's an atrium, people are going to walk in with their coat on, coming in the building. I'm not necessarily talking about a central atrium glass roof, because in this case, you'll have condensation probably uh, happening from warm air, moist air rising and then condensing on, on the glass and falling down. But if you have a vertical component to this atrium in a U-shaped building or H-shaped building or any kind of a, whether the atrium is both a vertical and an horizontal in terms of the glass enclosure, uh, here, I mean, if you if no one's really working in there, or if you're able to make them a nice little booth where their little feet are not going to be uh, chilled by the cold air downdraft, but if people coming from outside are coming in, that could be a good uh, a good solution. And the interesting thing is that you know, Elaine made the point say, okay, once the heat is inside your sh shades, your shading inside is it's too late. You let the heat inside. You'd rather have a shading device on the outside. Uh, that's completely true. It's it's even it's absolutely the case if you use triple glazing, because 
Now, the heat that comes in will never come out because the triple glazing will be three times absorbent because there's three layers that are opaque and there's probably also a low E component in that, in that layer for fun. Uh, and so that heat is trapped inside and the mechanical system has to deal with it or the natural ventilation has to deal with it. Double glazing, it's also not that great. It, you double glazing, you, you like in triple glazing, you'd like to have your shading on the outside. Absolutely, you don't want the heat come in. Single glazing, however, is able to lose a lot of the heat that comes in. So in the case of a, something you want to look like glass and you don't want the, the or you can't afford the, the um, exterior shading, single glaze, if it's in that buffer condition, single glaze with shading inside, which could just be something that rolls down, can actually work with some natural with some natural ventilation provisions. Can uh, can work. Um, the fun thing with quote unquote with triple glazing is that now you get when on a cold sky night you get the condensation on your glass, so you can see outside because it's too efficient. The glass outside is so cold that it now it can. It, the water condensate do condensate on the glass the same way it condensate on the grass, especially if you have a bit of a. I mean, if you if your triple glazing is looking at another building, there's going to be an, a, a radiative exchange. It's not going to be the case. So it's the same idea that when you walk in the morning to your car and you see dew on the roof and on the the windshield, but not on the side because the car is in radiative exchange with the car next door. And, and the, the roof on the windshield are looking at the sky, which if it's clear and there's not too much wind to evacuate that dew, will we'll condensate. We get the, this two part of the car is going to get really cold and there's going to be condensation. Absolutely. Um, I think we've definitely touched on quite a lot of the orientation also in that conversation, which is so important because as Elaine said, for every orientation of your building, things have to change. Your south or equator non-facing side needs a different uh, approach than your equator facing side. Um, and then Michael, I just wanted to ask, did you have anything to add? Yeah, we, were, uh, we were talking uh, the glass or the question I think was um, single, double or triple glaze systems. Yeah. When should each be used? And of course we all focus on energy use, but there's also uh, sound mitigation uh, which um, change of thicknesses and number of glass if um, <clears throat> a, a building near a, a train station or something like that we're trying to use um, sound mitigation so for sound if you have even two pieces of glass changing the thickness of glass from one to the other will change the um, um, the, uh, the sound levels coming through so um, so multiple pieces of glass there uh, for for sound itself is a uh, wise choice single pane single piece of glass would just uh, reverberate the same sound right through the glass. So just a, another thought outside the box. No, absolutely. I think that's super important. Students need to take acoustics into account. Um, it's, it's a huge part of the entire atmosphere uh, that you are creating. Um, wonderful. Um, and I do want to highlight for the students listening, um, when what Patrick said about heat coming in, heat can go out as well. So don't just think about what's coming in, think about how things are leaving as well. And that's where the ventilation systems come in. Um, wonderful. Okay, let's get into the next question. Um, and I think one of you touched a bit on this. Um, students love to design some crazy stuff and they love it being flashy and they want it to stand out. Um, so what are things students should be a bit wary of when designing those magnificent, Magnific magnificent skylights, the large atriums, all of those things that use the large giant panes of glass that are monumental. Um, what might be better solutions or is it an acceptable solution? Um, and Michael, why don't we start with you? What, what really goes into making those large frames of glass? <laughs> Um, large panes of glass. So I, I guess the the one thing I want to open with is uh, limitations. As far as um, I know, as Patrick, on one of your projects there, uh, there was a large vertical piece of glass. Um, I don't know what size that was, but uh, um, moving that around and must be uh, quite an event. Um, there are some limitations uh, to companies that we work with. Our company works with. We're, we focus more on 
six stories down and um, for the most part in our, our, our breadth of professional work, but uh, the glass we use usually around 130 inches by 300 inches or 3.3 millimeter um, yeah, meters by seven and a half meters is our limitation. So there are some limitations just for overall size, um, being able to move it and cost, of course, <clears throat> when you get into those uh, pieces of glass that are two inches thick, um, there are some certain limitations there. Wonderful. Um, Patrick, do you want to take it? <laughs> yes, I mean, certainly, I mean, it's interesting to explore as, especially as a student, the designer, somewhat oversized uh, glass, glass facades. Uh, I think if it's uh, envisioned in the context, perhaps, of a, of a buffer zone, a large glass facade, because it, already if you start seeing the, you know, the imprints of slabs on your large glass facade, it's less glassy altogether. So maybe in the context of a buffer zones, a multi-layered system where perhaps we know we're taking a little bit too much solar energy, but maybe that if we ventilate massively, if we have, you know, outlets at the very top and inlet and possibly, you know, downwind or just past the leading edge of a of the, the where the facade meets the roof, where the wind uh, negative pressure, uh, wind induced negative pressure are the highest, you could really have a nice uh, draft uh, out of that um, out of that space. So uh, yeah, I mean, well, I I'm excited when I see that. Maybe I'm the one who kind of let students go crazy on that. I I must say I rarely see the structural resolution where there would be something to hold that glass. It's the, it remains oftentimes just a line. Uh, but if uh, if indeed the natural ventilation is is integrated, I mean the point is that you don't want to you know glass. Say okay if if a person is working add a space, give that person a window to look outside, okay? But don't cook that person under too much glass. Uh, um, and don't, you know, just rely on an enormous piece of machinery, which has no reason to exist anymore. We're well aware that this major environmental concern we should, we should address, so let, let's be responsible about it. So, if the glass come with a good concept of ventilation, I'm for it. Uh, if it's just, oh, you have a big piece of glass and you don't know that it's actually facing southwest and uh, this is absolutely an horrendous solution, then I'm against it. I'd like to talk about skylights, actually. Um, okay. You asked specifically about skylights. Practicing in the southeast, no skylights, please, ever. <laughs> Anything south of the Mason-Dixon line, it's it's too hot. It's it's really bad. But you can do um, you can you can do indirect skylights where they're actually kind of grabbing light from the north, which is very nice. The other thing that I constantly tell students is if you are if your strategy is to daylight a space from the from the top, with, if you don't if you can't do windows and you're daylighting your space from the top. You do not need to cover that space with skylights. Technically, to, to achieve really beautiful daylighting, you only need about 5% of that roof area as, as skylight, skylight space. Now, you want to distribute it. You can't do a big, big skylight in the middle that's 5% of the area. You do want to distribute it, just like you would lighting. I approach a lot of projects with um, daylighting and skylighting the same way I would look at a lighting diagram, right? And I treat it the exact same way. When we were working on the National Museum of African American History and Culture, we talked a lot about the, the emotional impact of seeing daylight and what that means when you're looking at an exhibit that is emotionally overpowering, right? We have exhibits in that building that are uh, um, the galleries in those, that building that are intentionally very dark because the subject matter is very somber. But we have these little moments of daylight that come in intentionally. And that daylight is controlled. I would have liked to have gotten a little more because even the electric light in there, I could have had as fiber optic daylight. 
And that's something we don't use a lot in, in practice yet, but it's out there for sure, um, is being able to bring uh, daylight in from as much as 40 feet and higher in through a fiber optic line. And if I can control a light fixture, I can also control daylight. Absolutely. Um, and having been to that museum, it was the first museum I went to when I moved to DC. Um, it's a stunning space, but definitely that control of the light and you have to think of it all together, the feel of the space when you're talking about light coming in as well. Um, we are the keepers of the space, everybody. Um, and also you heard it here first, no skylights in the Southeast. Elaine has proclaimed it. Um, one thing I wanted to touch on was um, in an atrium, um, just a quick tidbit here um, from some crits I've gone through. When you have the atrium space, and this is more for the Northeast, um, don't have it in line with your, uh, wherever the, the air is coming out from, don't have it in line with the roof of your building because you're just gonna cook. Um, make sure you have a little pop-up and the air can get out. Um, this is my little human diagram thing that I'm doing here. Um, but I've definitely seen some bad crits happen when students put a line of glass directly in line with the entire roof. So um, be wary of that. Um, look at the Yale Center for British Art, I would say. Uh, that's a pretty good case study in working with your skylights. Um, okay, let's get into some more questions here. Um, so there's a tale as old as time uh, debate here in architecture of turning the corner. I'm sure you all are not strangers to that. Um, corners often stump design students. I <laughs> have had arguments with Patrick about my corners um, in my office building that I was designing. And it's really a chance to make it a special moment as compared to just, okay, let's turn the window. Um, they're also a huge point though of energy loss, especially when you have structure in the corner, um, when you have the frames coming together. So how can students successfully use glass or really just design a corner? Possibly you need to stop that glass. Um, is there a better alternative to what students may be doing now? Um, and let's start with Elaine. We ended with you last time. This is one of those things that when somebody, when a client says, can, can we make this a glass corner? I say, how much money do you have? Of course we can, right? Yes, the, the short answer is yes. You can, you can absolutely control um, the, the energy aspects of turning a corner with glass. It is costly. It is, um, it's fairly complicated. Um, we don't do it that often because of that. It is, it's gonna get value engineered out. Um, unless you're working on something that's really high profile. I, I, I don't think I've ever had a, a glass, a turned glass corner get all the way through to construction. Um, on the other hand, it's also how you see, what is your vision for the project? Do you want, do you want that part of the building to appear transparent, to, be, to appear light? Or do you want something really uh, marking the corner of the building? Sometimes that matters a lot, right? It's all about what you see and what, what your vision for the pro for that part of the project is, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I'll add a little bit to that. I mean, corners, they're not great to bring a lot of light because the light comes from one side and gets on the, from the other side. Uh, they're also not that great for natural ventilation. They're better than single side ventilation with just you know one window and the air has to come in and get out somehow and it's under the same pressure context on the, on the outside. So it's a, little bit, it, it's a little bit better, but it's not that great I mean, compared to a really a cross ventilation for building where there's an opening on one side and opening on the other side, and there's very different pressure condition on each side, and normally that, that draws air nicely uh, through uh, the building, as long as there's not too, much, too many obstructions uh, along the way and it's not super deep. Otherwise, air is lazy because it goes around the building instead of going through the building. Um, it's really, as Elaine said, I mean, there's a strong aspect of, of composition. What do you want architecturally? Uh, but you have to know a little bit, it comes with those, you know, it, it looks good, but it doesn't really do that much good uh, from a light standpoint. Um, now, 
at some point, you know, I'm a big proponent. When I, I see the amount of solar energy that we receive in winter in the Northeast, compared to where I am now I'm in Belgium currently, and or where I grew up in Northeastern France, where it's like gloomy forever, uh, for, you know, four months of the, from November to, to February, uh, it's, it really makes me cringe that there's not much happy free solar south facing solar harvest harvesting and now am i religious about it by say that okay now everybody should be turned facing south and bye bye any urban consideration aligning with the street playing nice with the neighbors and the urban space no at some point you know you have to be different i think um, the environment is important, but the fact uh, a little bit the same way you want as a designer, even if the code does not, in the US code does not tell you you should do that, the German code does. They say you can't work for uh, further away from uh, 20 feet from a window. For if you do, if you have no window, your boss needs to give you 20 minute pause every two hours, which is not completely economically very nice. So I, working in a project in Germany, had to say, oh, oh, I have to also put a window in a kitchen. Hmm, and that's complicated because now the kitchen needs to be reaching to the facade somehow. Um, so which we'd like to bury it and have those poor guys be completely disconnected from the, the outdoors environment. But if we're smart about it, we know that it, 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 it yes, we want to save energy, but we also want more people's life uh, a little bit better and maybe we're going to save some money on the, the, the uh, health bills of, of society. We're going to be a little healthier, a little happier and things will be better. So there's this aspect of what you give to people and what the people, the aspect that compositionally, what do you give to, this, to the city to be a good neighbor, a good building in a particular urban context where it's not just about performance and, you know, oh, I don't care, I'm turning my building facing south because it's better for me. Um, so there's the compositional aspect, but there's also the, ethic of an the ethics of an architect to say, you know, I need to give good space, yeah. both to people, but at, at an urban level as well. We do, we do have a convoluted two. answer. <laughs> To Elaine's, uh, I, can, I can build on what Elaine had said early on, is it, the problem is the structure in the corners. If you take the structure and push it out of the corners, at least at the level that we work with, I, I know you guys, uh, some of the panel here works with projects beyond my scope, but um, you can use a, a butt glaze system where it's not a completely, cur um, it's not a bent glass, it's a, it, it is two pieces of glass that, that join, but a butt glazing, which will have still some obstruction in the middle, but nothing like a, a, a um, a post or something like that, that is um, um, financially a little bit more uh, reachable than uh, bent glass or even something that's curved. But um, even in our um, our portfolio, we do have a, a corners both inward and outward that um, we uh, offer frequently. You just can't go too far from the corner. But there is some bug glazing, or even we have a, a small post that goes there to minimize that obstruction in the corner. But there are a few other options that might ease the financial pain of those uh, bent pieces of glass. So to summarize, if you're, we're all going into the work field, everybody. Um, if your client wants it, it can happen, but you need to consider it. And it's your job as an architect to talk about the pros and cons. Um, so feel empowered to do that. This is your crash course right now. Um, and you'll learn a lot in the field as well. Um, so something we haven't really touched on, um, glass is clear. <laughs> um, it doesn't have to be, of course, it can be opaque, but um, something that students, I think, um, aren't completely trained in is the balance of privacy issues when designing um, and using glass in their buildings and understanding um, if you can see in, uh, if you can see out, you can also see in most likely unless you're using mirror glass, um, which has its own list of pros and cons. Um, but how do how do students balance privacy issues when they are designing with glass? Um, let's start with uh, Patrick this time. Um, and this question, if we could keep it short so we can get to uh, one or two more questions before we end. All right, and I warn you, my family is coming back, so it, it might be, become a little noisier. <laughs> the, well, you know, 
glass is transparent if there's light coming from the other side. Otherwise, it's opaque. It's gray. So if I don't turn my light on, I'm very private be behind my large piece of glass. If I turn the light on, then I say, look, I am the exhibit. Look at me, how beautiful I am. And then I decide to uh, not be in that, in that privacy uh, uh, context. You know, I, I say I have shades, uh, organize the space so that there is maybe places, uh, you know, you, you work, uh, you occupy the space a little differently at different moments of the day to have, you know, that privacy. As, uh, aspect, I think it's a little bit of a, you know, something that every occupant, I, I guess, yeah, you can do a bad design that forces an occupant, a user, to be in that overexposed kind of condition and that that'd be really really bad but um, I, I mean the same way even when we do kind of basic building design where you say look we can we can do those european naturally ventilated things war buildings are all lightweight we're not going to use them uh, kind of a system approach where we try to cool down the building the structure uh, uh, at uh, at night uh, to benefit from that mean radiant temperature that's cooler during the day, and so let's have a system, a mechanical a mechanical ventilation, primarily, and let's uh, only have fixed glass and no natural ventilation. Okay, but well, if we do that, even when we just only do that there is going to be a little bit of glare control screen in the front maybe it's in, on, on the inside uh, so even kind of when you play minimal service like this because it's kind of general practice um, you can you know play with what that screen is about and how it gives you some level of privacy great um, does anybody have anything to add otherwise i'll go to the last question okay Fantastic. Um, so this will yeah, be kind of a wrap up. My favorite question. <laughs> All good. Um, so we'll go to the last question and I'm going to kind of combine a few of them that I sent to you all. Um, students, again, this is a topic that not everyone is super comfortable designing with. Um, so I would say across the board from innovations to um, systems thinking with maybe double skin facades, I don't know, in, like fritting, everything. What are the, what is the one missed opportunity that students don't take advantage of enough that you would suggest them looking into more? Um, I know that is a difficult question to just bring it down to a bottom line, but um, if we could, um, Elaine, would you be able to start with that one? <laughs> I think I have two and I'll be real quick. Oh, <laughs> One is something that Patrick's mentioned a few times, but not put it in this terms is the building within a building where you create this buffer zone and it might be all the way around. It might be partially around. Most of the ones I've done, I've been part of, have been all the way around because you can use that space pretty, it's a great flex space. And for most of the year, it's really comfortable space. It's just in the extremes, it may be a little bit out of the range, right? So that idea of a building within a building um, is is really efficient and it creates a beautiful space, right? I've seen this for schools that we did at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. I've done it for um, federal courthouses. It's it's really very effective. The other thing, and it's a, an opportunity in that you just it's an opportunity to make a really good decision. When you think about the operation of a window, we haven't talked about that a bit. Um, a lot of windows in the United States are double hung. If you're looking at residential office, um, small scale office, uh, certainly in certain cultural districts and things. Anytime you have a window that slides for the operation, it can't be tight. If it were tight, it wouldn't slide. So you've, you've got an inherently leaky unit, even though they do a lot. I mean, they're sealed, they've got gaskets, they've got a lot. If that window unit opens and closes and has a tight closure, and then I can even crank it shut, there's even like an extra crank lock that gets it really tight, there's no wind that's gonna come into there. It's a much more comfortable window. 
So sliding doors, no. Sliding windows, no. I, I built my net zero house in a historic district where they wanted me to put double hung windows. And I had to make the case, I put in casements with an extra wide, I hate this, but it's an extra wide center rail to make it look like a double hung window. In another life, I would not have caved to that because it looks stupid. So don't do that. <laughs> Wonderful. Michael, do you want to go? I'm chuckling because uh, it does look stupid, <laughs> but um, I, we, uh, we certainly do the same thing. And I, I agree with everything that Elaine says, um, uh, understanding how those sliding windows, I agree, we sell a lot of them in, uh, in parts of the country, but um, yeah, they're, they're, they're comparatively um, less performing than the other, the, the swinging windows. But um, I, that was just really my only add there. I'll put a plug in for the European windows too, that actually they look like double hungs, but they tilt in and out. Then you've got perfect ventilation in and then out in the cool air comes in low and the hot air goes out high. And it's very, it's a really nice unit. I don't know why they're so expensive in the United States. <laughs> well, I guess it's just a dominant, the way of doing things that the, the two sets are here, the factories are here and and it's it's uh, and it's and it's difficult to change. <clears throat> well, advice to the students: I say, okay, always try to stand back and look at it from all aspects, including you know, say, okay, compositionally, how am I a good neighbor in the city? Am I a good citizen building? Um, but also, you know, how how does it feel from it from inside? Does everybody get access to daylight? Or are we tolerating, I don't know, chicken farms where the animals, the worker in this case, doesn't see any, any light of the day and become disconnected from the, from the outdoors. And, uh, you know, consider wind patterns around the building, air flows patterns, consider uh, light uh, aspects, uh, but think about the rain to come up with a good design. So can this, windows still be operable even if it's raining um, intrusion noise i mean there's beautiful also european windows being developed where in a sense we say okay if i open the glass i'm bringing the noise in i don't i do not want that so what you could do sometimes is just add a piece of glass which could be a hard coated low glazing to reflect some of of the of the radiation that leaves a gap all around so it's kind of a piece of glass in front of the actual window. It acts as a intrusion protection. It let you open the window big, but it's really just the the, the little crack all around that front uh, uh, pieces of glass that let uh, air in. Um, so, so all the aspects, you know, say how how does it uh, how is it uh, controlling noise. Um, um, yeah. All, all it. I think looking at it, uh, the building as a system, as as much as possible. Absolutely. Um, I th I think that really sums it up. Everything is a system. Everything's interconnected. Today we have touched on the number of glazes, the orientation, thermal comfort, um, skylights, atriums, monumental glass, turning the corner, low E, fritting glazing cavities, double skin facades, ventilate. I think we've touched on a lot today. So um, if there's anything maybe we mentioned, um, like electrochromic, I, I hadn't heard that in, before. I heard it for the first time a few months ago. And so uh, I really suggest everybody really take this in, uh, the students listening, look up anything that you feel could be inspiring to you. But something I wanna give advice to the students on, um, this is really something baseline for you to know when you get into the field and makes you an asset because the thermal comfort while also the energy efficiency of a building is something that's gonna, it's, it's a hot topic already, but it's just gonna increase every single day exponentially. So, um, Something I found in school, this is me professing a little bit, um, is that we tried to pack in so much into a project, into a semester. It is okay to choose a topic area in your building 
and focus in on that. And if that is energy efficiency and climate and the glass and the systems, do it. Um, I think that's not an area that students really focus in on enough and it's going to make your portfolio look great. So that's just a little, little comment from me. Um, I hope you all have enjoyed this so much. I think we in the panelists, we could go on for ages. I have so many more questions I could ask, but I really want to thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Elaine. And thank you, Sierra Pacific for sponsoring this uh, webinar. Um, but this has been fantastic. Um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day, everybody.